Thank you for joining us today. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Justine Nolan and I am the Director of the Australian Human Rights Institute based at UNSW in Sydney. And we're all very excited to be part of this panel um, discussing really practical case studies on accountability and remediation in the business and human rights sector focused on Asia Pacific. Um, we're very grateful that the um, forum is continuing and the support of all those who are establishing this really important forum for this discussion um, around situations in Asia and the Pacific at the moment. So let's get straight to the point around, you know, the discussion that we're going to have today and um, I'll let, in, let me introduce you to our panellists. We are at the point where the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights have now been in operation for a decade. But it's very clear that the victims of business related human rights abuses are often struggling to be hold accountable, the relevant state and non state actors um, for the abuses that are occurring. And the Asia Pacific region is no exception to this global situation. In fact, we might argue that it's very exasperated in, in our Asia Pacific region. In recent years, Individuals and communities affected by business related human rights abuses in Asia and Pacific have used a real variety or mishmash of methods, um, judicial and non judicial pathways to try and secure access to effective remedy and corporate accountability. They've been assisted by some of the lawyers and civil society organisations in this quest and we are going to get their insight today from this remarkable panel. So what we're aiming to do in this session is examine these diverse pathways that have been tried so far and look at both the positives and the negatives, what's worked, what hasn't worked. We're going to focus on really practical case studies from across the region and the panellists are going to consider the challenges they've faced, any remedies they've obtained and also the reform options that might be needed to strengthen access to effective remedy in relation to the issues that they're raising. So let me introduce you um, to our four panellists that we've got today. First up, um, we have Jan P Park, who is a public interest lawyer working for the Gongam Human Rights Law Foundation in Korea. She's a founding member of the Transnational Human Rights Institute at Gongam, and today we'll be focusing her remarks in particular on the Lao Dam collapse case, where the dam collapsed. Uh, then we also have Leah Maitoris, who's the executive director at the Center for Environmental Concern and the Philippines, and also part of the Asia Pacific Network of Environmental Defenders. Today in particular, she's going to highlight um, the case of Oceana Gold, the mining situation in the Philippines. John Sutherland is the independent examiner of the Australian National Contact Point for the OECD guidelines. He's also a mediator, lawyer and adjunct academic. And today he will be discussing in particular an OECD complaint originating in Cambodia, um, in particular against an Australian bank. Um, and finally, we have um, Saw Ratanami Pokla, who is a lawyer and executive coordinator um, with Prashant Singh of the Community Resource Centre, the CRC, which she co-founded in 2010. Through the work of its lawyers, CRC has successfully helped set legal precedent in public interest cases. And she is going to be talk about one of those ongoing cases against a Thai sugar company um, and its impact in Cambodia. So how we're going to start this today is we're going to, I'm going to ask each of our panelists um, to give a brief uh, discussion, sort of brief introduction to the case. So we're not going to go too much in depth um, into all the remedies, but what we want to do first is for each of these four cases, set the scene, what happened, where it was, who were the main stakeholders, and sort of the pathway that they've highlighted to remedy. And then we're going to dig in a little bit deeper through discussion between the panellists of what remedy they sought, what worked, what didn't. Um, and then in this session, we will be um, encouraging and opening up to Q&A from the audience. So please um, post your questions as you go along. Um, and we will have a, a section at the end where we focus on your questions that come. So um, without further ado, then let me start by moving to Jan to talk a little bit about and set the scene around the Lao Dam collapse and what went on. Over to you, Jan. Hi, thank you, Justin. So I'm going to be talking about the Lao Dam collapse, 
that happened back in July 23rd of 2018. So one of the settled dam of Sepian Senanoi hydropower dam system collapsed and it unleashed just huge amounts of water and causing severe flooding that inundated 19 villages nearby. The water flowed even to the neighboring Cambodia villages downstream as well, and it was one of the worst dam flooding Laos has, have ever, has experienced. The official death toll amounted to 71, and more than 14,000 people were displaced. However, due to a lack of transparent surveying, the true number of lives lost may never be known. And this was a very complex build operate transfer project launched in back in 2013 by Sepian Sanamnoi Power Company. And I'll be referring to it, it as a PNPC. Um, it's a special purpose corporation established by a joint venture with the South Korean companies SK Engineering and Construction in charge of building the dam and Korea Western Electric Power Company, Coepo, for operation and management, and Rachabri Electricity Generating Holding Public Company of Thailand, um, RACH, and the Lao government-controlled Laos Holding State Enterprise. So it's a very, there are many stakeholders involved, and largest shareholder of PNPC is SKENC, with 26% of the entire share. Coepo and Ratch each hold 25%, and LHSE holds the remaining 24%. Um, it was a mega project with an investment of over $1 billion. And in particular, the Export Import Bank of Korea is closely linked to the project by financing over $70 million with a concessional EDCF loan and credit assistance to the Lao government. In terms of the cause of the dam collapse, SKENC is blaming it on a heavy rainfall at the time, while Lao government officials and COEPO blamed substandard design and construction. While none to date has been held accountable for the disaster. Well, soon after the tragic accident happened, Korean CSOs in the relevant issue area formed a task force team called Korean Civil Society TF to carry out response efforts and to participate in solidarity activities to seek remedies with the international network of CSOs such as Mekong Watch, International Rivers, Lao Dam Investment Monitor, and Inclusive Development International. The seeking adequate and timely com compensation for the victims, back in 2019, the Korean Civil Society TF submitted a complaint to Korean NCP and a letter of allegation to the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights against Korea Export Import Bank, SKENC, and COEPO. After reviewing the complaint, however, the Korean NCP decided to offer a good office on SKENC and COEPO, but dismissed the Export Import Bank of Korea. Um, well, after only offering a minimal effort to engage the companies involved, however, KNCP declared that it would stop the mediation efforts and close the case due to SKENC and COEPA's refusal to participate in the mediation efforts. The Korean Civil Society TF believing that Korean NCP violated the rights of the complainants by failing to disclose the investigation process transparently submitted a petition to the National Human Rights C Commission of Korea on 29th of September last year. Disappointingly, however, on 20th of January this year, NHRCK, um, National Human Rights Commission of Korea, also dismissed the petition on the ground that KNCP is not a government agency within the meaning of the National Human Rights Commission Act. Most judicial and non-judicial remedy options have been explored and exhausted. And with KNCP and NHRCK's passive attitude towards addressing human rights violations by the Korean companies business activities abroad have been a huge roadblock in providing access to remedies for the victims. 
um, I'll stop here for the brief introduction of the Loudoun disaster. And I'll Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, so that gives you an overview of the scale of the problem um, that she's presented. And at this stage so far, really the lack of accountability. So the reference there to the Korean NCP was talking about the Korean national contact point using the OECD guidelines, which John will also explain a little bit more um, in his case. Um, but you can see from Jan's discussion that there were a number of activities and mechanisms that they've tried and still trying, but so far without a lot of success. So let's move to the Philippines. And Leah, if you could explain a little bit about the context of what you've been working on in relation to mining and Oceana Gold. Thank you, Justine. So um, just to give an overview of the Oceana Gold mining operations in the Philippines, it actually acquired its um, permit in 1994. Um, initially, it was owned by Arimco Mining and Climax Mining, which are both Australian companies. Uh, it covers 11,489 hectares of land in Didipio, Casibu, Nueva Vizcaya province in the northern part of the Philippines. It was acquired by Oceana Gold in 2006. Oceana Gold is a Canadian-Australian mining company. It started its commercial operations in 2013 as an open pit mine and uh, transitioned to an underground mine in 2016. After 25 years, um, its permit expired, so that's in June 20, 2019, and it filed for a renewal the previous year. So after the expiration of the permit, the town officials declared that any kind of operation beyond that day is illegal. And the provincial government ordered the um, local government units, accord, uh, ex uh, including the provincial police, um, to, ho to have a restraining order restraining any operations um, from that day on. So the local community um, actually put up a people's barricade. They set up a camp in the entrance of the mining operations to implement this restraining order. So in July, a month later after the expiration, Oceana Gold filed an injunction um, saying that this, uh, what is happening is unlawful restraint of operations. But the regional trial court denied this. Um, in October 2019, Oceana Gold then suspends its operations. However, many residents still observe that the Oceana Gold Mining Company still tries to enter the mining area saying that it is just for the watering operations. But um, they are suspecting that it is more than that uh, because of the amount of um, gasoline that, or crude oil that they're trying to um, usher into the mining, uh, mining site. So um, uh, as of the status now, uh, the renewal is actually nearing its um, fruition. It only lacks the signature of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the President. And we think that um, it is actually near, um, but uh, it is just a short time before the um, permit renewal will happen. So what are the main issues um, with regards to the mining operations? Um, since its operations, uh, it caused uh, an irreversible change in the topography in the mining area. It actually stripped off uh, an entire hill and covered farmlands because of its mine tailings impoundment. The deforestation and loss of habitats affected many uh, plant and animal species with a recorded 499 plant and animal species in the area. Uh, um, residents also just, uh, observed a decline in water supply, both for domestic use and uh, for agriculture. So this also affected their livelihood. There's also um, an observed water pollution with high levels of copper concentration, which are beyond the safe levels. Um, aside from that, uh, there is also a high acidity in the farmlands, which also affected their crops, especially rice, which is the main um, produce in the area. It also displaced many residents um, who fear the military, so they just sell their lands. Often, um, they are not compensated accordingly. And um, in 2008, 187 houses were demolished. 
So the operations also caused conflict among the indigenous people because there are two indigenous people there that had a blood compact so that there would, no, there would be no conflict. But because of the mining operations, um, uh, many residents claim that some of the uh, employees of Oceana Gold talked to some of the indigenous people groups. So um, they are now fighting against each other, even um, among the indigenous people groups themselves. There is also a constant presence of military detachment and this has caused fear in the community. There is also red tagging or um, the naming of certain individuals and organizations as member of terrorist groups or um, communist groups. So in the Philippines, when you are red tagged, uh, it, is all, um, it is almost always a prelude to other attacks. For example, um, being arrested or being killed. So this has caused great fear in the area but the community members still uh, continue uh, with their um, actions to oppose the mining company. There is also harassment and intimidation with many death threats among the community leaders. Um, and just um, during the time of the pandemic, uh, their um, people's barricade was dispersed because the Philippine National Police tried to usher in the fuel tankers of Oceana Gold. Um, one was arrested and many others were injured. So another issue is with the vagueness of the mining policy in the Philippines. Since um, there is no clear uh, uh, provisions whether or not if you, are, um, if you have filed for a renewal, if you can continue with your operations or if you have to wait for the um, final issuance of the renewal. So since then, aside from the People's Barricade, we have coordinated with the Commission of Human Rights, the National Human Rights Institution in the Philippines, and they have themselves declared that many human rights um, have been violated. We have coordinated with the UN Special Rapporteurs, and this resulted with communications to the Philippine government. But um, unfortunately, this did not lead to any concrete actions. And we also have um, uh, coordinated with the Canadian government through the International Commission of Human Rights in the Philippines, its chapter in Canada, um, gathering support from Canadian citizens to um, support the petition and seek accountability uh, from Oceana Gold and its human rights violations in the Philippines. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Leah. Um, both yourself and Jan have presented, you know, presented very complex case studies uh, with multiple players um, you know, in multiple jurisdictions and real risks to the people on the ground. Um, and so far, not great news stories um, with these case studies. So let's, um, let's go to John, who can uh, talk about uh, the, a case that came before um, the OECD uh, NCP in Australia to explain the context and what's, what's happened with it. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Justine, um, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners where I am today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to to those of, of where everyone is uh, in today's meeting. Um, as Justine said, um, I'm the independent examiner with the Oz NCP, so I will be talking about a, a, a complaint and a case that the Oz NCP handled, but I need to make uh, very clear at the start what I'm saying is, is from publicly available documents and, and mainly the decisions and the statements on the Oz NCP's um, website. Um, it's, a, it's a case I'll just give a, a quick overview. About five or ten years ago, um, an Australian bank called the, the ANZ, through a branch in Cambodia, um, made uh, some finance available to a customer there that had an existing sugar refinery plant. Um, and there are, there were, and um, it was known there were issues around social and environmental concerns and impacts uh, related with that that project. Um, and ANZ um, acknowledge now that they say they they didn't do sufficient or, or adequate due diligence before making that loan available. Um, over the over the time, there were uh, engagement, or I understand there was engagement between ANZ and the customer. But in two thousand and fourteen, 
the relationship in fact ended. So uh, that, that loan ended and it was no longer a client or a customer of ANZ. And shortly after that, a complaint was made by, um, on behalf of communities in Cambodia, so by an NGO in Cambodia, Equitable um, Cambodia and Inclusive Development International, an NGO in the US. They made the complaint to the Australian National Contact Point um, under the OECD guidelines and they were acknowledged. They said, look, we understand there is no longer a relationship there, but that ANZ has benefited from that and that there are ongoing impacts um, related to that to that financial assistance and so that was the the essence of the complaint and it um, there was uh, some attempts at mediation but no no agreed outcome and so in 2015 I understand um, with no outcome then the the AusNCP made a, a final statement on the case that took some time um, but that came out in in 2018 and it observed that ANZ hadn't undertaken due diligence sufficient for the OECD guidelines, made some recommendations about improving procedures and said it will follow up within 12 months time on that. And, and it was during that follow up, um, so 2019, that the parties indicated that they wanted to um, meet and, and talk about this. Um, and in February 2020, um, there was a further mediation. That was um, one that, that I was involved in. Um, and the agreed outcome at the end of that, um, and this, this statement is um, agreed between the parties, um, that ANZ um, agreed to contribute or pay all of the profit it made uh, from that uh, loan to the communities in, in Cambodia. Um, and also to commit to um, reviewing or strengthening its, um, some of its policies and procedures. ANZ, um, and, and the ANZ said they're not uh, legally liable to do that. And I think this will be an interesting point we can, we can pick up in the discussion. What can the law provide and what can, can mediation sometimes get um, a different outcome? So that, that was February 2020, um, that agreement was made and, and that statement, as I said, is available um, on the AusNCP website. And I know we'll come back to things in discussion. I guess the, the key thing to, to I'd like to emphasise here is this is the agreed outcome of the parties. So um, yes, it, I, I think it is a good outcome um, and, it, and it shows the potential that can come through the NCP process but uh, by no means think that, oh, look, that's, that's what an NCP can always provide. It's, it's very much um, at the, the whim of the parties and, and what that mediation process can engage. So I might leave it there. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, John. And um, you do raise an interesting question, which we'll get to in, the, in a discussion shortly about the various mechanisms and which ones we might emphasise and prioritise in terms of outcomes particularly judicial versus non-judicial, because all of these case studies, case studies so far have focused on, in particular, um, non-judicial mechanisms, whether it's through human rights commissions, um, through the OECD, um, through the UN Special Rapporteur process, um, but not so much a strict legal approach uh, with it. Which brings us to our final context setting, um, and a, a little bit of a, and, and gives us a little bit of a different approach from SOAR um, because some of the uh, mechanisms that she has been relying on has been sort of the pursuit of litigation and looking at the role of law and seeking accountability here. So over to you, SOAR, if you could give us the context for the um, particular case that you have been focusing on um, with the company, uh, Sugar Company. Um, so I think you might be on mute. We can't hear you. You might just check that. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Um, this case is about the Thai company invest in Cambodian. Uh, the Thai company went to establish the new company under the uh, Cambodian law. Then it's become the Cambodian company. Uh, but the Thai company is also over ahead like a 
uh, control all the things in the in this Cambodian company. The Cambodian company get the concession, the land concession for uh, sugarcane plantation in Otto uh province. And then uh, during the concession, because of under the concession law of a Cambodian, if they found villager living in that area, company need to pay compensation and company have to uh, make it in the right way to get the to get the land from the communities. That is, but during that time, the company just used the the armed force with the military and police to grab the land from community and some uh, community house has been burned and they got the land from the community about for uh, 700 family lost the land uh, live all the is about the for the leaf land living and also for the agriculture land and then finally the victim have been supported by the ngo in cambodia and also international organization to seek the uh, remedy for the community and also to seek the getting the land back for the community then they start with the sit, submit the complaint to national human rights commission of thailand to ask the national human rights commission of thailand uh, investigate the case and we found that the thai company involved in in this case and anyhow after the nsrc made the decision uh, and report saying that the thai company need to pay compensation to to the victim but nothing happened and community still uh, suffer from that then finally the uh, the ngo just contact to our organization contact to me uh, thinking about bring the case from cambodia to thailand because they don't uh, at the time they don't trust on the uh, the court in cambodia because they have experienced another case similar like this and they did not get anything that is why uh, we discuss and we see, we see the opportunity because under Thai law, we have the conflict of law that the victim from other country, whenever Thai, uh, the Thai people, Thai company doing something outside the country and violate the, uh, why make any violation, the victim can bring the case to Thai court for us the remedy. This is under the conflict of law. And this is also, we find a case for the civil court under the tort law. Anyhow, we cannot bring seven families from Cambodia to Thailand. And lucky that Thai, uh, Thailand, we have the class action lawsuit procedure to accept the case. Then we use this case for the class action lawsuit, just bring only two represent representatives from Cambodia to find a case to, in the civil court in Thailand uh, for the uh, for the tort law under the class action lawsuit. The challenge is it's not easy and it's become a first case for the transfer case using the class action lawsuit. Then first court dismissed our request as a class action. Then we, we appeal to the appeal court. Finally, uh, on the 31st July last year, the, this case have been um, this case have been accepted under the class action lawsuit. Then this case now uh, will have a trial under the class action procedure. That is another challenge because of its many things to to bring the case and also the challenge of this case is not only handle the case under the class action procedure but because of thailand doesn't have the subsidiary law then we have to use the agent law to to prove that the thai company is related with the cambodian company that thai company have to respond whatever the cambodian company have done in the incident uh, for cambodian uh, incident then that is the first challenge and second challenge is about because of this case it's not happened like a recently it's happened for many years already then the evidence 
to prove about the compensation is not also not easy. And because of Cambodian is a, a is a like a developing country, they don't have enough capacity to collect the information, collect the uh, evidence to prove for the compensation. Then it's also the other the other thing that we have to see how we can prove that the the that the violation is happening and how much that the damages uh company needs to to pay for the compensation and this case is already we find this is the third year on the uh, the fourth year on the case but it's not it not start trial yet it's very take long time but anyhow uh the victim also have uh, have a hope for this case because of the they realize that Thai, uh, Thai justice will be better than the Cambodian justice because we have a proper uh, proper procedure and they got the support from uh, many stakeholders like uh, NGO, international NGO, and also with the legal team that we work together. But we also have a challenge that we need to use the Cambodian law apply to this case. Then we need the uh the legal profession uh professional for uh showing what is the cambodian law what is the thought law of the cambodian what is the land concession of the cambodian and uh, of, of the cambodian law and also we have to prove about what is the violation under the cambodian law and what is the under the conflict of the law between thai and cambodian this is this uh uh, this is also where it will be long, long time for uh, making the procedure and also getting the result. But I have hope that this this is also the opportunity of the Thai government, the Thai state, to to uh, to show that they have the extraterritorial obligation because of nowadays Thailand have a lot of investor uh, on board. They invest in F in many country in Mekong region and other country, then if this case uh, show the result, it will be the good to prove that uh, investor, where, where the investor go, where the investor on board, they have to respond. They need to, uh, they need to uh, respect and also giving the remedy for the people who they already violated in those countries. Thank you. Thank you, so. So let me just recap before we go into a discussion now with the, the panelists. So um, just so people can catch up and, and follow along. And if you're a little bit lost on these cases, um, you'll be able to Google them pretty quickly if I give you a few words around them. So Saul was talking about a case where we have the Cambodian farmers who are now filing a lawsuit in Thailand against a sugar producer, um, and the sugar producer, Mitt Pol, spelt M-I-T-R, then P-H-O-L, um, is alleging land grabbing, uh, among, uh, among other things. And these, one of the challenges is that these main abuses occurred back in 2008, 2009. So that's one of the cases um, that we have. Um, Jan had started off talking about the collapse of a dam in Laos. Um, and looking at this really complex scenario where you had government, investors, companies, um, a whole group of stakeholders involved across a, different, a number of different countries. And we'll come to that question. John's case that he's highlighting um, was the case in, um, that happened in Cambodia um, where the, it was an OECD complaint brought to Australia. Um, and that complaint was brought against ANZ Bank. Um, so you'll be able to find that one. And then finally, um, Leah is dealing with the mining, um, the development of a mining site and the associated um, corporate abuses that are alleged that are going along with that in the Philippines by Oceana Gold. Um, what these situations all have in common is that they're um, quite complex fa fact scenarios and that not one problem is alleged in any of them. That many of them have multiple human rights abuses that they're alleging, 
and also environmental um, issues with many of them. And one of the things to explore with the panelists is also thinking about, is it more useful sometimes to argue that these issues are environmental and look for solutions under environmental law or mechanisms, or is it best to frame them as human rights problems and bring the environmental and development issues um, within that? So before we go to some specific questions, I wanted to sort of grab onto something that John said um, when he was presenting. And he said, you know, it's interesting to think about when we think about mechanisms of corporate accountability and we divide them between sort of legal and non-legal or judicial and non-judicial. And there's a tendency to grab to the legal and the judicial and say, that's the best solution because if Sora is successful in her case, she can get a binding court order which will require compensation to be paid. And we've seen in both the fact scenarios that Jan presented and Leah presented is that they've now tried several mechanisms and they're struggling to get really follow through and action on those, whether it's through the UN, whether it's through um, the OECD or whether it's through national human rights um, commissions. But in John's case, which was also a non-binding mechanism through the OECD, um, there was actually this mediated solution. And there's a question of whether the law would have been able to give that same solution in relation to that and whether the path that was taken in relation to the Cambodian um, case against the ANZ Bank was actually better um, in that mechanism. John, do you have any thoughts about that sort of dynamic between law and non-law and drawing on you know, what you've heard in, the, in your own case? Thanks, Justine. Um, I think that's right. I think if, if anyone went to a lawyer either in Australia or in Cambodia and said, um, here's these issues, can you point us to the law that will say the bank will has to give over all its profits to the communities to address or for them to use uh, to, to try and remediate some of the environmental and social concerns. I think all the lawyers would look through their law books and they would tell you both on the Australian side and the Cambodian side, there, there, isn't, there isn't such a law. Um, and also, even if there is, where, where would you go to try and find a, a court or a process to, to enforce that? So um, it, it, it reinforces, I think, the, the, the potential there for if, and it's a big if, I understand it's it's a big if in mediation, if you can find some interests between, you know, this is the company, this is the community, and that's always the, that that dynamic of mediation, you're trying to find those, those common interests and be working in that with the parties to help them uh, explain, help them understand. Um, and, and maximise that that degree of shared interest. Um, and sometimes that that will line up in a way that everyone can see an outcome that they're prepared to live with. Um, it's, it's not always going to be the case. Um, and it's not always going to be the case that what's shared is necessarily within the OECD or clearly within the OECD guidelines. Um, mm. And I think we'll, we'll pick up, I've got some thoughts on the environmental human rights issue that you raised earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold that. Sure. And um, I mean, one other thing that is interesting about these case studies in both John's case study with Cambodia and ANZ and Saul's case study with Thailand um, is that you, there was a clearer path to accountability in terms of focusing on a target. Um, and you were particularly in both cases, you know, whether it was the Thai sugar company or the bank, there was a very focused approach to, to seek accountability from that stakeholder. Now, the case study that Jan presented, and to some extent, Leah as well, you start to diverge in stakeholders. And, and Jan, your case study is probably the most complex with those involved. So how do you make that decision about the path you're going to do to seek remedy and who is the stakeholder that initially you were focusing on as you know, the one that you wanted to focus your accountability mechanism on? As you mentioned, Justin, this loud and disaster case involves major stakeholders such as Lao in the South Korea government, major banks and ODA funds and big companies operating worldwide. And with such complex deal structure, there exist layers of layers of decision-making authorities and responsibility 
which may cloud the efforts to allocate the responsibility for the harm caused. And even when the entity to be held liable is determined, whether or not the remedial action could be enforced was is totally different story. Um, the big draw for the Korean civil society TF to pursue the OECD NCP process was that um, concerned civil society organizations could file a complaint on behalf of the victims with the KNCP based on the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises because it does not require that the affected community themselves file complaints. Well, of course, the possibility of legal, seeking legal remedy under the South Korean judicial system was explored from the beginning of the response efforts, because in the, after all, um, you know, over 50% of the PNPC shares were held by Korean companies and also Korea government's money was also involved. But um, the, the biggest um, hurdle was that uh, the Korean judicial system does not allow representative litigation and thus it necessitated the affected party to come forward as a plaintiff. Um, having the actual victim as a plaintiff would, would not only have made the lawsuits in Korea available, but would also have added much momentum to the advocacy works, both um, overseas and also in Korea. However, without any law or local NGO to facilitate the communication with the residents um, in Lao community, it was, it was nearly impossible to find a plaintiff. And as Leah mentioned, you know, there are dangers involved with um, being seen or coming across as criticizing the, the Lao government or um, in this case kind of indirectly because Lao government was also uh, involved through LHSE. And Yang, can I just ask you, sorry, just pick up on that point around um, the, the lack of a local plaintiff and the lack of a local NGO. Now, it's not that none don't exist, but none were willing to take on this case and take the risk, as um, Leah mentioned, risks in relation to that earlier. But was that the reason or you felt that there was just no appropriate NGO on the ground? So to begin with, it was difficult to, to get an access to the local communities. Um, the Korean Civil Society TF has carried out um, two field investigations, but the, the first one being uh, right after the disaster happened, and the second one being in January of 2019. And for the second time, when we visited the second time, we had to kind of disguise ourselves as tourists because there were military points set up to, um, to uh, you know, to not allow outside um, NGOs to have an access. And also, yeah. um, for example, one of the members of Mekong Watch, she visited the field, but had to um, kind of warn the other civil society organizations that it wasn't safe for us to get to to um, visit the site. And the affected people themselves were in such dire conditions that it was hard for them to, you know, um, to organize and pursue any remedial actions against the, the stakeholders involved. And yeah. So I might just turn to Leah, thank you, Jan, for on that point, because you also raised the real question about risk. Um, and how do you, when you're evaluating options for accountability mechanisms, how do you evaluate risk and how do you counter that risk in terms of involving the both affected people and the local communities? So when it comes to communicating with local communities, it's also a challenge for us at this point because of the military detachments and the harassment in the communities. But one of the things that we're trying to do is to um, reach out to the community and connect them with uh, local lawyers um, who would give them um, like tips or ways for them to counter these um, Harassment, for example, if they can, we are exploring about 
um, filing cases about the different harassment um, issues. And also we um, talked to them about the human um, mechanisms that they can do, for example, to minimize the risks. So it's really um, also similar to the case mentioned. It's uh, civil society organizations and human rights lawyers who are helping the local communities. And um, for us, I, we are really happy that they are, there are very brave community members who continue to take action despite the many types of um, harassment that they have faced. And for us, with regards to the question of what kind of um, case we're focusing on and who are um, the main um, um, targets for this case, it's difficult for us to prove that Oceana Gold is the perpetrator of human rights violations. For example, um, if it is their private um, security groups who harass the community members. So it's one of the things that we find um, difficult if we're going to raise this issue with the Canadian government. So when it comes to human rights violations in terms of uh, civil political cases, um, it is mostly focused on the Philippine government. So that's why we talk to the Commission on Human Rights and also explore administrative cases, if any, um, that, when, that we can file. But when it comes to environmental issues, that's the thing that we think that we can file against Oceana Gold um, as the company itself. So um, there are many challenges also to that because it's also difficult to gather information in the area that is um, controlled by Oceana Gold. So this then brings up that question I think we raised earlier in some ways, when you're looking at a path of accountability, is there a clearer mechanism for linking a company to the wrong under environmental law versus human rights law? Um, and that differs from country to country um, in many ways. And what you just highlighted then is that there is perhaps a more, it, there's a clearer link with the environmental um, harms that have occurred. Um, and that depends on how the country um, has set up. We're getting some interesting questions, so I just want to jump to some of them now because they're about topics that we're talking about. And so this one is back to you um, and also, sorry, my lights just went out. It also relates to the point we made earlier about law and non-law. The question, Saw, is that the challenge, it recognises that the challenge you're facing in the class action are very formidable. And it notes that in some other jurisdictions like the UK, for example, many companies have settled cases before they've gone to trial. Um, you know, this is even once the plaintiffs have secured the jurisdiction. And while this can be very good for the, pl the plaintiffs, it's, it's very difficult then, you know, to set precedents and it's hard to follow with future cases. Um, so the question is, what do you think are the prospects for settlement in your case, as opposed to getting a binding judgment? And, you know, why might you prefer to move towards settlement as opposed to following through on many years in relation to get to judgment? Uh, so you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, actually for, for the case, uh, in this case, uh, we start with many years already before submitting the case as well. We also thinking about how we can handle the case when the case is I mean, the victim and the evidence, all the thing is outside the country. But lucky that we have the very strong uh, community and also uh, the strong villagers who who want to uh, follow the case and who want to uh, uh, seek the remedy and they get support with the strong commitment by the uh, NGO, local NGO and also international NGO as a uh, equitable Cambodia and, and uh, international uh, development institutes. That is the uh, that is the one to make we think that even yeah it will take long time in the court and under the court law and Thai law is also some case is 10 years before finalize the case or maybe more than that but we also think this is this is just the the, the one channel that they can they can come to to seek the remedies because this case is not only start with the with the court case. They already applied for the OECD. They already uh, making the complaint for the, uh, ask the, for the getting the 
getting the remedy from through the supply chain as the uh, like a Coca Cola that they request the Coca Cola as a member of Bongsuko to stop to stop the demand or supply from the Bitcoin company and then uh, but by that way the the remedy is not come to the community you know because of it's just like a making pressure on stock violation but not pressure to like a giving the remedies to the common to, to the community that is that is that is why we have to do in the case like this from my experience we have to do like a parallel we have to do non-judicial and judicial together and then see how it works and also because of the case like this have a supply chain we have to see and track what the supply chain and how we can get uh get the support for that to make the the cost of the cases is about the victim it's not mm -hmm. about the ngo work it's not about the uh, international work but we want to see how the community can get the remedies how they can get back their land even now the company said that they return back the land to type to the cambodian government but community did not get any land yet over i think it's over five years already but nothing happened it's because of um the the responsibility of the company and and the government sometimes is not come together and also sometimes they use it as uh, how to say uh, negotiation sure. on the cost of them not on the cost or on the behalf of the community that is why this this is the way that we have to do we have to do both parallel in the way of the case of the task for the case yeah, I mean, you raise a very good point about the parallel processes. And, and so what you have going is both a judicial and a non-judicial. Um, but in Yan's case and um, in Laos and in the Philippines case, there's multiple non-judicial mechanisms that they're pursuing at once, whether it's through the OECD, the Human Rights Commission uh, or the UN. So they're sort of pursuing multiple paths in that. One of the questions, the next questions came in um, is for you, John. Um, they said, you know, it's good to see that ANZ has taken responsibility for their actions, but they said that maybe from ANZ's perspective, it's still got a good deal by not being asked to pay a penalty for the non-conduct of due diligence and the harm that was caused. Could Might you argue that if it had gone through a litigious process, the penalty would have in fact been higher to encourage deterrence as opposed to a mediated settlement, which perhaps might be lower? Um. I guess the first response is where where do you get that penalty from? Uh, you know, and I know I'm being a bit flippant. You, there's nothing in if we're thinking the UN guiding principles, if we're thinking the OECD guidelines, that doesn't talk about penalties uh, for for not doing something. That's about what's the impact, what's the remedy, what's the due diligence in response to that. So if you're if you are wanting um, a penalty if you're wanting an enforceable outcome then the OECD guidelines are, are not somewhere where you should be spending your time um, yeah if you've if if that route is available and clearly available um, and and you've got that as an option then I guess that's the best advice to the client and, and you would go that way but um, you know that I I don't think that would have been an option in in this um, in this particular case and it was was you know as I, I keep harping on this point it's a way of trying to find a way that to, to convince the parties look here, here's an outcome that that you both get something that that is you can live with yeah i mean as saw has highlighted as well is that um the downside of the litigation the judicial mechanism it's very difficult to get the necessary evidence to proceed um there are a lot of jurisdictional problems in actually placing it in a court um, and it's very long, um, you know, so it's it's years and years in the process likely before you even get to court. Um, and then it could be, you know, another four or five years at minimum um, in getting resolution around that. But what might, sorry, might I just add a, a quick yeah. one? It's also a way that 
that is available if the law is very clear that you can't get there. I mean, if someone's written a contract that says, this is clearly not our company's responsibility because it's your company's responsibility, no one can come to us, and yet the profit's still coming back, there's still that link there. You know, the, the UN guiding principles are quite clear. You have a responsibility. Um, it doesn't matter what you can find some domestic law to say. Um, so that that is, I guess, a flip side that, that yeah. the OECD guidelines and that process offers. Uh, and the next, one of the questions that come in is more general about remediation around, you know, each of the cases in that we've highlighted different processes, but the, this question sort of says, well, what is exactly that you are looking for in relation to these cases? Um, is it likely the you know the the audience member asks is it is it likely that the most feasible way forward in the Lao Dam case is actually some sort of settlement where there'll be a payment and a mediated settlement and is it money is it you know restoration of land um, Leah in your case what is the remedy that you're looking for in this case it's clearer in Saw's case and in John's case we have an example but Leah for example in yours what would be what is the remedy that you would seek in this case? First and foremost, since the renewal process isn't complete, we hope that um, the basis that we have raised, the environmental um, impacts as well as the human rights violations would be enough basis for the non-renewal. Since they're saying that um, they have checked all the requirements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, Ursana Gold would have any negative impacts. So they're just complying with the legal requirements. So that's the one thing for the non-renewal and also to hold accountability. So potentially, yes, compensation for damages for the local communities. And as for the human rights violations by um, state entities, for example, the police and the military, it's of course accountability. And um, there are um, uh, uh, case, cases that we can file um, for example, administrative cases regarding their types of actions um, in the community. So it's also accountability for the state entities. Um, and just to draw you out a little bit on that, when you say accountability for the state entities, what, what does that mean to you? What, what would you be asking? Um, for, the, for the military units to be involved, I think there can be um, cases that they can be removed from position um, potentially, and also to remove the entire military detachments in the communities. And um, for the police that were involved in the violent dispersals to have uh, action also, they would be also removed from position. So um, I'm not sure specifically when it comes to the policies of the military and police, what other cases that they can um, take or file against the, their, own, um, um, their own personnel. Sure. And um, Jan, back to you in terms of remediation. If you had your choice of what sort of remedy you were seeking in this case, what is it that you would be asking? So first and foremost, this is a tragic disaster that had a um, high number of people being just, you know, um, being gone missing and dead. And with such tragedy, we wanted to find out what went wrong and who should be held accountable. And in that way, what we would like to achieve is to, to prevent any future disaster from happening again. And also at the same time, um, the remedy of, in terms of the compensations, the companies had um, insurance policies, so the, the, remedy, the money to cover the remedy could come from there, but because there was no, um, for example, because the the, uh, the the responsibility finding and all this um, the uh, remedial actions took such long time, the victims their suffering had to double board and triple because they had to stay in the temporary camps for extended period of time without knowing what's going to happen in their future. And at the same time, one of the victims, like some of the victims told the, um, the NGOs later that they weren't even aware of the presence of the dam upstream until the water just flooded 
and inundated their towns. And what we want to do is to ensure that the safeguards for such huge project will put in place so that people won't have to suffer like this anymore. And with Laos especially being having a lot of dam projects going on and Lao government promoting the battery of Asia policy, we thought that um, this case could be a test case where we could really ensure the safety of the local people. Yeah, so I mean, in, in, one, in both your case and particularly in Saw's case as well, there's this argument that you're trying to set a precedent, I and mean, arguably so in John's case as well, that this, if this harm occurs, then you will be held accountable. There is something, you know, to hold you to here. Um, one of the questions that we've had in is more technical, so I'm going to leave it open to who wants to tackle this, and I'm thinking, John, you might start with it. It says most of these cases are directly linked, sort of using the words under the UN guiding principles or the OECD guidelines, um, which, and, and it says that companies generally have no duty to participate in remedial processes. Um, and so as opposed to perhaps the language of falling under that the UN guiding principles refers to companies causing or contributing to the problem, where they're then required to be involved in remedy. Um, so the panel, they asked, do the panelists think one should do away with this distinction altogether? So let's everybody be involved in remedy, whether you were directly linked or cause or contributed to the problem. Are or are there alternative ways to address seeking remedy in relationships which might fall within that directly linked category? John, do you want to start with that technical question? A, a quick one. I, I can see I can see some value in look if everyone has some connection, then then they all should have some responsibility. But I think that is going to avoid a lot. You know, for a company that that has a very small amount of connection, um, they're probably not going to want to say, well, then it's up to us to provide the bulk of remedy, particularly where they maybe don't actually have control over um, the, the things that need, need to change. Um, you'll note, uh, I mean, if people want to um, find the, the final statement where, the, where it was agreed that was what was paid in Cambodia, you'll see there, there's actually no wording in that about is this cause contribute to or is this directly linked and that's because the parties chose they didn't want to address that they wanted an outcome and, and that's what was achieved there um i think that's probably enough from me for the moment yeah and i mean it is that tricky situation particularly um the distinction that's made in the un guiding principles around where companies have caused or contributed to the problem then they should have an obligation to be involved in remedy um and then there's, you know, ongoing discussions, particularly about the role of investors. You know, which category do they fit in? Are they more likely to be the contribute? Are they directly linked? Which is sort of a technical discussion that is people on the ground who have been killed, injured, harmed by these activities are very less interested in. You know, to them, they look at the company up the chain and they see that, you know, but for you being involved, um, this would not have happened. Or but for you making that investment, um, this problem would not have occurred. And so it's, you know, it's less of a distinction when you're sort of looking up at that as opposed to, you know, this, this distinction that the UN guiding principles um, makes in relation to it. But let's come back to that, um, one of the questions that you've all raised because several of you are pursuing um, or have been involved in cases where the principal um, target of accountability is outside the country. Um, and others are within the country. Um, and so it's this interplay too between local and international lawyers, civil society. Um, and Leah, you also pointed out that actually the impact has caused people on the ground, particularly indigenous peoples, to come into conflict with each other about you know, how to proceed, who to follow through and which mechanism to, um, to, to do that. So, I mean, I sort of throw it open to the panel to think about how necessary is that international dynamic on these local problems? In, in the cases that you've pursued, what's the value that's been added either by you sitting outside the country or deliberately involving international stakeholders? And Leah, I might throw to you first because you sort of mentioned how you'd sought to bring in a Canadian in, impact there and the Canadian influ influence to impact what was going on in the Philippines. So. How, you know, why did you make that decision and how relevant was that international leverage that you might have gained? 
the first um, international institutions, organizations that we went to were also civil society organizations involved at the international level. So we think that it is important to gather solidarity and to help us also, for example, when it comes to their expertise in research um, and the like. So the second um, international institutions that we went to was the UN mechanisms. And for us, um, we think and that- Can you just specify which particular UN mechanism you used? So for, um, we communicated with um, six special rapporteurs. Um, the Special Rapporteur in Hazardous uh, Substances, Environment, Business and Human Rights, Freedom of Assembly, Human Rights Defenders, and Poverty. And that resulted in um, the communication or the response of nine special rapporteurs that were sent to the government. So if we look at the timeline, the suspension of Oceana Gold happened after the different international engagements. So we think that um, somehow that kind of pressure helped um, contribute to the um, decision or the pressure to the government um, and, and, uh, and not renewing the permit right away. So it has been about two years um, since um, they have uh, declared suspension and we think that is already a big a victory for us um, when it comes to a big uh, international organization. So. Um, of course, the UN uh, mechanisms have their own limitation. For example, they cannot investigate without being invited by the Philippine government. And um, at, um, at the end of the day, it would still rely on how much the government would take um, their recommendation seriously. So one action was um, uh, talking to um, organizations in Canada, as I mentioned. And um, the petition that they filed actually uh, gathered a response from the Canadian Parliament. Um, but it is just a statement at the moment. And um, uh, we uh, do not know yet how much that has transformed into action. So it's just, a, uh, they all, they just said that Canadian companies, whether they are in another country, should um, practice due diligence and uh, follow policies, both local and international, especially when it comes to human rights. So international support, both from um, fellow CSOs and the UN, uh, is really a great way to gather um, public opinion or attention to the issue. And maybe that uh, we're hoping that would um, eventually uh, lead to bigger um, results or bigger forms of action. Yeah, so it's an important point that sometimes when you're sort of seeking support or looking externally, that it's, it's not so much for an immediate remedy or solution, but it's using the leverage. Um, and it might be that you're using the mechanism of the UN, UN Special Rapporteurs to again highlight and raise the profile of the issue, to get international attention that would then bring attention, you know, sort of increased pressure on it. I mean, both John and Jan, you've presented cases that um, you specifically pursued remedies through the OECD um, NCPs, the National Contact Points, and you got quite different results. Um, on very different circumstances, obviously. But one of the criticisms in relation to the OECD mechanisms is that there's a lack of consistency sometimes between the NCPs in different countries. And there's almost like this need to forum shop um, so that you can get an NCP perhaps who will take things more seriously in relation to it. And so how much does this, um, you know, when you look at the Korean NCP, Jan, um, did you find that you went through a process um, that provided you, I mean, you didn't get the results you want, but you, did it feel like a process that was useful um, and, you know, worth pursuing in relation to your case? Well, unfortunately, Korean NCP has been pretty consistent in terms of their outcomes um, in, in, a, in a negative way, unfortunately. And uh, in this case, we pursued the KNCP because both companies were in Korea and under the OECD guidelines, corporations have a duty to respect human rights and to avoid and to address any adverse impacts on human rights um, by providing adequate remedies. Um, in Loud and Collapse case, the Korean civil society believes that the measures taken by the respondents the Export Import Bank of Korea, SKENC, and COEPO 
fail to serve as remedies for the harm that occurred, nor did they satisfy the due diligence policies to prevent or mitigate further um, adverse impacts. And um, although the outcomes for communities assessing NCPs around the world have been mixed, as like you said, um, the Korean Civil Society TF team was hopeful that even if mediation fails, which you know seemed likely given the history of KNCP decisions, NCP will at least be able to put some pressure on the companies involved because um, NCP may assess violations and issue recommendations in its final report. Um, unfortunately, it did um, neither, and it dropped, it just like I mentioned earlier, it um, closed the case and in, in its final report just recommended that we um, continue the channel of conversation with the, uh, with the respondent to discuss possible um, remedies and, and um, any further cooperations that's, that's desirable. And sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, John, how do you respond to that? Because, I mean, in your position, you've seen um, very different results often around the globe from OECD and CPs. And I mean, these two cases are apples and oranges, so you can't compare them. I mean, the Australian NCP was criticised for many years um, about its approach and has undergone um, some substantive reform in the last few years. So how do you, you know, sort of tackle that criticism that there is a real inconsistency um, between NCPs and that perhaps there's a lot of effort that goes into these complaints in some countries um, and that there's, you know, there's no guarantee of uh, following a, a consistent procedure around the world? Yeah, I, I guess to just to pick up quickly on that point, you said that there, there, there was some criticism and the Aus NCP has um, changed, went through a reform process and part of that is is actually my position. So as independent examiner, I only deal with the complaints um, and, and that is said, okay, you're independent, government doesn't influence your decision on those complaints, but equally, I don't speak on behalf of, of government. Um, so, uh, I'm, what I'm saying now is not in any way to be understood as, as a view of the Australian government or, or the Oz NCP. Um, there is a, look, there is a, um, an unevenness, I guess we could say in, in this jurisdiction, and that's because the OECD guidelines um, leave it to each government as to how they, they want to, or, or they choose to implement the national contact point with the, um, emphasis that they're, they're wanting to achieve um, a, a consistency. So um, absolutely, we can we can look at cases and say, oh, there's some different outcomes here. But I think I'd also go back to the introductory point that I made that I I think it's a little unfair to say, oh, the Aus NCP is great. Look at that outcome in Cambodia. Because again, that is an outcome that came through what those parties agreed to. Yes, you know, we we provided a forum, we provided some influence, um, but, but, it, but of itself, it's, it's, not, it's not a court that gives you the clarity, this is where you get to. And I think the, probably the last point I'd, I'd say is, um, if you actually look at that, that case, the first statement that was made in 2018, a lot of people may have been um, perhaps a little critical of that. Oh, well, it's just a statement saying ANZ didn't do enough. And, what what's that provided? Uh, um, but but in fact it was there, um, and and just by providing that forum, then there's an opportunity for for those parties to come back together. Um, thanks, and we're we're sort of nearing the end of our time together, and we've got only about ten minutes left. And thank you for your questions. If you have any last minute questions, we can still sneak them in um, to the panel uh, today. But. Uh, in sort of trying to bring this together a little bit with these very different um, case studies. And what we can see is that, you know, remediation and accountability are really the, the sort of the thorn in the side of the business and human rights movement. And they're set out clearly in the UN guiding principles, but we know by delving into these really complex case studies how messy it becomes. Um, and it's messy on lots of fronts. It's messy on trying to find a clear pathway for accountability. 
Um, and, and that's, you know, there's all the pros and cons of judicial versus non, non-judicial. But it's messy and also trying to identify the most relevant stakeholder. And this relevant stakeholder may not be the, you know, the group that you might think is most culpable, but it might be who you have the clearest path toward and how you approach that. It's messy in trying to get access to and ensuring that those persons who are affected have a voice um, in that accountability process and that they're involved and that any remediation that is devised is very much focused on their needs um, with it. And then it's messy in relation to the work of all of these people, um, both here and in a broader case involved with these cases, in that they're really at risk um, with a lot of, of this work that they pursue. And it might be that in many cases, you simply cannot pursue accountability in the country of origin um, where the harm has occurred. But I guess if I was, you know, if I was taking each of you in the panelists and pushing you forward 10 years in time. So we've deal with this and in a nice world, all of your cases have been resolved successfully for your, um, the people who've been affected. What is it in 10 years time that you would be looking to see that the business and human rights um, movement had got to a point which made accountability perhaps more simple or more straightforward, or that there was a you know, greater understanding of what we should be focusing on? Is it that there's a clearer legal pathway? Is it that the non-judicial mechanisms are more consistent and that they're um, approachable and that people can access them? Is it that on the part of companies, there's an acceptance that they should be involved in accountability and remedy? So put yourself forward 10 years and think about what it is that you would want um, you know, to see in the business and human rights field around accountability and remediation. So Leah, let me put you on the stock spot first. If you had a you know, a, a miracle that you could ask for something or want something in 10 years, what would it be in relation to this? So first, um, I think um, knowing where to come to for immediate action. So sometimes it's uh, a stakeholder that um, you think that's the most responsible, but there are other ways to have um, more immediate um, uh, success or remedy I think that's um, the knowledge and that would be um, hopefully be more accessible for the people. And also how the people can also access that. For example, um, even access to a lawyer is difficult for local communities. Um, what more um, to file cases when there are fees also and that is really expensive for local communities. Most of the time it would require having support for from other organizations, both local and international, but given the entire, um, given the many cases in, um, in the whole region, it would be difficult to have that kind of support. So um, in the future, I hope that is something that um, environmental and human rights defenders would also have. And um, as an addition to that, um, it would also be good if there is a, um, a policy that is legally binding for example in the philippines there is no policy um, to protect environmental human rights defenders uh, because environmental human rights defenders have their own vulnerabilities and their risks so that kind of policy in the philippines would really be helpful and also for the asia pacific region for example there's the escazu agreement for latin america to protect environmental defenders but in asia pacific there's um, there isn't any, uh, there's not that kind of policy. So having a legally binding policy would um, give more protection. So um, I think also um, solving the root of the problem, for example, for human rights violations, when it comes to environmental issues would be really important. So um, the usually the attacks that happen is a uh, response to the uh, reprisal or a response to the opposition of local communities. And there, if there is nothing that they are opposing, then there would be no issue. So if there is only due diligence or um, companies that really adhere to um, the human rights standards and uh, policies in the country and, and, their, uh, and international policies, I think um, that would uh, really help to um, reduce that kind of conflict and really uh, encourage responsible business and human rights. 
So um, Leah's obviously somewhat of an optimist thinking, hoping that in 10 years time that we've, we've solved all of these problems, that there are no business and human rights harms, which would be a, a wonderful world that we live in. But basically what you're highlighting there is a better straightforward path to access to, to remedy, that people have someone to go to, they know who to go to. Um, and those experts can then, you know, in particular advise that. One thing we haven't had time to delve into today, um, you know, is, is the question of, the, you know, the fate of a global business and human rights treaty, how that might affect accountability and remedy and how that might be influential. And also the fact that the Asia Pacific region is the only region in the world without a regional human rights body. Um, and that we don't have the mechanisms that are in Africa and America and Europe for a regional body that might have more specific a uh, focus on these issues. So Soren, your sort of in final remarks, in what would be, you be hoping to see in 10 years time that would improve the situation for your work? Oh, so you have to unmute. I actually support for the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights in every country. It's even it's like a it's a soft law. It's not the um, it's not enforced with the company. But national action plan is the one that the uh, civil society can use to work with the state, to the government, to make the implementation and develop the any law to any law or any mechanism to make the responsibility and also. Uh, respect and remedy for the company and first thing that we have to make the equality between company and the villager the victim from the human rights uh, violation because we know that company have their own capacity to access for the, the justice but the the people who uh, the victim they may not have enough capacity for that and especially with the, some country that is difficult like allow what uh, we we heard a lot or even in Cambodia but for the specific law cannot find any victim come to fight the case against the company even they got a lot of uh, damages but we we as a uh, are working with the ETO watch we are also seeking the victim to bring the case to Thai court because one company is linked with this dam, but we cannot find anyone because of if someone if somebody speak out in Laos, they will be uh, harassed and also maybe put in jail by the uh, government. Then first we have to make equality for company and the victim by the state yeah. support. The state yeah. should take side with the victim, not take side with the company or not be a middle person to wait for both parties fight each other. Then sure. that one, the national action plan is the one that can be the mechanism. And also I would like to see the company itself also show up themselves to, to make the due diligence. At least the due diligence mechanism is also good for the company. It's not only for making them uh, uh, thinking about the human rights violation, human rights view, but it's also for their own business. If they have the due diligence, it also can help them to move forward for their, uh, for their business because of people, if they follow the human rights guiding principle, they will, they will not be protest from the com community, from the civil society for their project. That is sure. also the, the cause of the uh, following the human rights due diligence or human rights uh, mechanism. Then this this is the kind of thing I would like to see that in uh, in our region and also in other places that we can make the equality for company and uh, within by the state support. Thank you. Um and so again, there you're talking about that mix of soft measures that particularly might then influence law and policy on the ground. So whether it's through a national action plan or other mechanisms that we may try and um, make sure that the law and policy changes. 
Um, we've only got very short time, so Jan, just briefly, what would be your crystal ball wish? And John, I'll go to you next, but we only have about a minute each. Jan. Well, if in 10 years' time, I would like to see the streamlined standards that can be applied um, globally because the nature of business will only expand and become more transnational. And if the victims has to, you know, um, depending on the perpetrator, if they had to find different outlets to get the remedy, it would be a very complicated. So in that sense, to make it more um, accessible to everyone, I guess that's what everybody else, Leah and um, so also mentioned that it'd be great if we can have UNGP, for example, be um, mandatory and enforceable on all nations that are members of the UN, for example. And also for, and domestically, I would like to see the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation being put, put in force so that right now it's only for public companies, but so it will hopefully expand to private companies as well. Thanks. And there are other sessions during this forum where they're going to go in more detail and discuss the initiatives around mandatory human rights due diligence. And basically what all of the panellists have said so far is that they really want to focus on preventative mechanisms. So we don't get to this point where we need to sue companies or hold them accountable, that in an ideal world, there is greater due diligence and preventative approach and a change of corporate culture that would improve. So John, finally, the last minute for you. What's your question? Oh, that, that, that was a nice uh, wrap up, Justine. Yes. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I think it's, I, I expect and I hope we'll see better coherence. Um, so it will be not just uh, that your, your, your company PR or sustainable development mob have a nice statement that that's actually understood um, and, and used on the operation side. And I think it also reflects the same thing Saul was saying about national action plan. That's a that's the same kind of idea of coherence within government. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, you've all raised really great points and provided us insight into um, really complex case studies and, and and given us some hope, I think, you know, there's, there's some progress that is being made. But most of all, I want to thank you, um, each of you for the really important work that you're doing. And, and and forging ahead on this path that gives us all the rest of us ideas and and you know you are all setting precedents in ways to improve accountability and figuring out what works and what doesn't which is hard work um for you guys so thank you very much for the amazing work that you are all doing and good luck with it and i hope in 10 years time when we meet on whatever the equivalent of the zoom is is that all that you can report is that you are all retired because there are no violations that you're having to deal with and and life is pretty good. So we look forward to that. Thank you all for joining us today um, for the UN Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum in Asia Pacific. And we look forward to the discussions in the coming days. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you. All. Thank you very much.